Salam to Tainaist Aling, fraternal Ethiopian greetings. Salam to Tainaist Aling. Peaceful greetings. May may God, may the Almighty sustain and give you health on I and I behalf. Shalom, Chavarim, Shalom. So the question right here is when did Christianity, as it's called, when did, quote, Christianity, that has to be defined, that term, right, in its respective time. We have a generalization of what Christianity is, but suffice it to say for right now, this is the basic opening subject. This is a topic of discussion and reasonment here. When did Christianity, let's ask, ask it like this, when did Christ, right, <laughs> slash Christianity, right, come to Ethiopia? Christianity, Christ, Christianity in Ethiopia, right? We're just thinking about how we're gonna like, how we're gonna, gonna title this right here. But the question is, when did Christianity first come to Ethiopia? Was it the fourth century, as many have been made to believe in the make-believe, have been made to be naive? Many believe that Christianity, as we know it, first came to Ethiopia in the fourth century. And when they say Christianity, when we say Christianity, and they say Christianity, they're meaning this belief, this idea of Christ, that before the fourth century, Ethiopia knew really nothing about Christ and there was no Ethiopians, so to speak, following Christ. So what do you think? When did Christianity first come to Ethiopia? Was it the fourth century? Was it during the time of King Azana? Due to Frumentius, one named Frumentius. Who was Frumentius? What's the true narrative? We've been hearing different ones speak about this. And we've been hearing um, different heresies, like a lot of hearsays, you know, that really oppose the true testimony and the true narrative, the true evidence, right? So if I'm asking, when did something happen to you? I should at least hear, well, what is your testimony now? If your testimony was one thing, right, way back then, and you was consistent with that older testimony, but nowadays I'm hearing a whole new testimony, what would this tell me? It was tell me that something happened, something went on, because your testimony was consistent over all this time, and then you kind of change your statement, you change your testimony, you change your witness, right? Sometimes they say, it's an unreliable testimony. So what we hear today concerning Ethiopia and Ethiopian Christianity, some call it orthodoxy, more properly is referred to as Tawahido, right? First came to Ethiopia, right, with the Israelites of Ethiopia. So the belief in the Messiah, Moshiach, which is a Hebrew idea and a Hebrew concept with this word sound, Moshiach, we can clearly see it in the scripture, as we say often. We're going to do a vlog on this as well, brothers and sisters. I know I've been saying I was going to get to this, even though we have gone into the doctrine and the teaching from the scripture and the historical evidence that the first Christ, right, the first Christ in the Old Testament sense is Aharon, is Aaron. And the first Christians in the Old Testament sense, according to the principle, is the sons of Aaron or is the priest. So we have the Kohanim. The Kohanim, the Kohen Gadol, the high priest. First one we have, according to the scripture, according to the glory right, of the conquering line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, according to the glory of his majesty. So his majesty says to us, of the namesake, we rise to far of the namesake. For my part, I glory in the Bible. Now we have to also recognize that our pre-existing um, condition, our education, our um environment, our experience has ill prepared us. Right? This is why we have to study to shoe our self-approved. This is why we're proposing that we need a re-education, right? Like an Ethiopian Hebrew re-education, right? Along the lines of the teaching of his majesty. And the teaching of his majesty can be found in documentation pre-1974-75 by and large, right? Much easier and much more correctly and rightly Right, articulated than we find generally speaking in the documentation post 1974-75 just to make that as a point of order point of note so ones might also recognize certain books and documents that we go into and we use as points of proof 
right, as witness, as, as, as testimony, as evidence, right, tend to be older manuscripts and older things that have been written, right, and also from the Ethiopian Hebrews or the Israelites of Ethiopia. Now, when I say the Israelites of Ethiopia, I'm pointing to when the first, we could say, seeds, right, even though we can see the first seeds going back to the time of Moshe and Moses, according to the Bible, right, and according to the Torah, according to the early, the first books, right, in the so-called, quote, chronological order, right, that's found in the Bible. And we're going from low degrees to high degrees, so we're going to refer to KJV, the King James Version, which is the most, you could say, popular and the version that has been used in the West over the past 400 years. But to answer this particular question rightly and accurately and also to provide ones with a point of reference and the documents for themselves, Right, so ones can, according to the teaching of Gurmawi Nagus Nagas, his imperial majesty, can know the truth for themselves. So, point of reference, 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 reference. So, some point to, let's bring this out right here. Let's see what exhibits we have. Okay, what, what exhibits do we have? All right, let's first of all go to his majesty, right? So, right here, this is from one of our books right here. This might be from... Um, the gospel of him, go him, the go him, the gospel of him right here. Let's zoom in here. Selected utterances of Gurmawi, Gurmawi, Kedamawi, Haile Selassie, Gurmawi, Nagusa Neges, Kedamawi, Haile Selassie. Just want to bring that out in the royal Amharic, the royal name, nomenclature, his imperial majesty, Gurmawi, Nagusa Neges, Haile Selassie the first, Kedamawi, Haile Selassie. So let's Let's scroll down right here, right, and we have the Bible speech, just a little portion, right, of the Bible speech right here, right? Here it says, we in Ethiopia have one of the oldest versions of the Bible, but however old the version may be, in whatever language it might be written, the word remains the same. It transcends all boundaries of empires and all conceptions of race it is eternal now we should first of all recognize that this is a translation but this is no doubt one of the official translations you can find it also as a very good page on the YouTube's I mean not on the YouTube's on the on the internet on the Google Google and YouTube you know in bed together but anyway on the Google the wiki Wikipedia you can see on the Wikipedia page right this is one of the undated speeches but it has been referenced and has been proven to be a speech of his majesty right so he's saying right here what's he saying right here? he said he didn't say that ethiopia has the oldest but one of the oldest version of the bible but in spite of how old the version of the bible may be and in whatever language it might be written when it says the word now how do we see the word how do we see the word here i've had certain discussions with other Rastafari and others who also say Rastafari and they have said well they look at the word like well it doesn't matter whether we go to the Amharic or whether we go to his majesty's bible whether we go to the Hebrew or even the Greek that's not what he's saying there the word who is the word what is the word let's just answer this question succinctly right here all right let's go right here let's bring up the word right my sword my sword right so here in my sword my sword my sword Right, let's go to beginning, right, and let's put word, right, beginning and word, right, the beginning and word, right, and here we're going to, let's go right over here, beginning and word, right, and John, John's gospel, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, was with Elohim, and the Ethiopic was with Egziavi, the sustainer. And the word was Elohim. And the word was Egziavi. This is the context of what His Majesty is saying. This is, this is what we argue according to the teaching of His Majesty, as Majesty meant by that. So we have translations or we have versions of the Bible, but the word, right? Even that word from the beginning, that word that became flesh. So if we go through this even a little bit more right here, it says the same was in the beginning with Elohim, with the power, with Xavier, with the sustainer. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Right? In him was life, 
and the the life was the light of men and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not now interesting as what well, we have there was a man sent from Elohim from Xavier there was a man sent from the sustainer whose name was Yohanan or Johannes the same came for a witness to be a witness of the light that all might all through him might believe all men you see men is italicized very taught on that might admit might might take credit here we have peace to you peace to you peace to you all right to think to be true to be persuaded to credit to place confidence in right he was not that light but was sent to be a witness of that light that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I remember in the beginning was the word. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. So what are we speaking about right here, here, here? He came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the B'nai Elohim Right, to became become the Waluda Xavier, Xavier Lijoch, the children, the sons of El Elohim, the power, the sustainer. Even to them that believe, that admit that credit, right, that admit that think as true on his name. Right? And right here, here, here it says, which or who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of Elohim, but of the power. Once again, for the word, and the word was made flesh. So the word, word was made flesh. This is the incarnate. This is the incarnation aspect, the word. Remember, in the beginning was the word. My, the Father, Elohim Ha'ab, Xavier Ab spoke that word in the latter days and time according to the Barit Hadasha, the New Testament, Adis Kidan, right? That word became flesh in the womb of Kedis Mariam, of Holy Mary, Mariam, right? And dwelt amongst us, I and I, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of Ha'ab, full of grace and truth. Now we'll pause right there at verse 14, right? So this is the point of reference. This was our reason to, you know, another one who had actually come from a different perspective. He was arguing that every translation, he, he said that, well, what is, what's Matthew saying here is that every translation is all the same and doesn't matter. The book of the seven seals is Matthew's Bible or doesn't matter. You know, if we, you know, say, well, this was translated from that and the, the translation is lacking in something he would say that well according to his matchy speech that the word is still one and the same we're saying no the word right there is not with the word he's speaking about he's that word even that word from the beginning my that word that actually is already in us right remember that light of life is already in us every man that comes into the world but we don't know we are unconscious we've fallen into this you know, this is a, a fallen consciousness that on the earthly plane, we're living in a fallen consciousness and we're seeking to rise, that resurrection, right? And instead of saying it transcends, we could say that he transcends all boundaries of empires and all conceptions of race, that word that is that spark of life. It is eternal. Then he goes on to say, no doubt you all remember reading in the Acts of the Apostles how Philip, baptize the Ethiopian official all right now we're gonna have to go to another another area right here let's see if we can go to another area right here where we have a little bit more on this particular word sound right here let's see if we okay let's see knowing that material spiritual okay okay this is a little better right here this is more of the fuller the full the fullness of it all right so let's just do this right here all right so once again, we in Ethiopia have one of the oldest versions of the Bible. So his Massey's perspective is not that we in Ethiopia have the oldest version, but according to Gurumawi Nugus Neges, his Imperial Majesty, we have one of the oldest versions of the Bible. But however old the version may be, in whatever language it might be written, the word remains one and the same. 
right? So the word was from the beginning, right? Then versions, right, of the Bible, right, the collection of writings concerning the word were written, but the word still is still one and the same. Yovas, the word is still the one and the same because the word from the beginning. Right? And that word transcends all boundaries of empires and all conceptions of race, all ideas and ideology of what race is and who this race, that race. It is the word is eternal. Remember, it's that same word that lights every man that comes into the world. Now, this is a little bit on the theology of the word right here, but it's important to understand that. So that doesn't become a stumbling block, but rather a stepping stone. So let's step up to the next paragraph. It says, no doubt you all remember reading in the Acts of the Apostles how Philip baptized the Ethiopian official. He is the first Ethiopian on record, no check, on record to have followed Christ. Oh, 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 oh. So some talk about Christianity, right? But let's get to the root. What's the, what's the root? Etymologically, what's the root of Christianity? The root of Christianity etymologically is Christ. Right? And Christ, according to the Bible, Christ, let's bring this up as well, just to clarify these points at the outset. These points need to be clarified at the outset. Because a lot of ones have an idea of certain things, right? But to be clarified, according to the scripture, we're talking about the Bible. And it's Matthew speaking about the Bible, right? So we have to be able to view the Bible, right, from His Majesty's point of view. All right, so we have two verses right here, right? Two verses. One in John chapter 1, verse 41. He first findeth his own brother Shimon, Simon, and saith to him, We have found the Messiah. So you see the Messiah here, right? The G3323, right? It says, Thea definition, Messiah equals anointed, right? It's the Greek form, right, of Messiah. So it's the Hebrew form of Messiah, Moshiach, right? They say here is the name of Christ. But actually, according to what's written here, that, you know, this is the definition. Some things are true, but we have to find the truth for ourselves. What this says is that we have found Hamushiach. So they're speaking in the Hebrew, right, in the HD, in the Hebrew definition, right, in that high definition. But here in the version of the scripture that is written, it is giving an interpretation to the reader that might not have that HD, that Hebrew definition. Right? You can't overstand right, the Hebrew scriptures from a Gentile mind, in a Gentile mind. You cannot fully overstand the Hebrew scripture as a Hebrew. Right? Let this mind be in you, which is being interpreted the Christ. So we have found Moshiach, which is the Hebrew, right? which is being interpreted Christos. It's like right now if I'm speaking Hebrew to y'all, right? and most of y'all don't know Hebrew, right? I would have to give an interpretation for it to be even relative, relevant, or even useful or practical for you. Otherwise, you're hearing a word you have no idea. So it sounds nice, but you don't know what it is. Right? So what we have here is that this idea of Christ, Christos. Right? We have Christos right here. Right? Right? Christ was the Messiah. Christ means, from the Greek, means anointed as Moshiach means anointed. Right? Christ means anointed, right, in the Greek, right? But that was to interpret the Hebrew. That's what it says, of Hebrew origin. So we're getting to origins, right? Getting to the roots, right? Origin, Mashiach, Mashiach, right? We have anointed, anointed one of the Messiah, the Messianic Prince of the King of Israel. So kings of Israel were anointed as Adamawi Hala Selassie himself being anointed, and crowned, right? His wife, Etege Menon, Katamawi Waleta Georgia, she was crowned the very same day by the will of His Majesty. But His Imperial Majesty, right, is that King Messiah. He's the, he's the one that was anointed, right? King of Israel, also one of his titles, right? Upon that anointment, that anointing on November 2nd, 1930. So we have other kings of Israel who are also anointed. Right, so this is all part of the, we could say the, the Hebrew, you know, the Hebrew um, theological, you could say, um, order, right? This is all part of that order, right? The ancient order, right? Of the high priests of Yisrael. So we have priests, prophets, right? We have priests and kings being anointed. First one in the scripture who carries that title of Messiah 
or in the sense of the Hebrew Christ is Aharon, is Aaron. Cyrus, Koresh, right, who was a Gentile, right, that was in a time when the black Jews of Persia had returned, right, and he was called by the prophet Isaiah before he even came about, according to the scripture, to be a Messiah. He's one of the only non, you could say, Israelites in that sense, a Gentile who is referred to by Yahweh, hey, Yahweh HaKadosh, Baruch Hu, Baruch Hashem, the Holy One, blessed be He, blessed be the name, as a Messiah. Then we also have the patriarchs, like the fathers as anointed kings. All right, just to get to the, the root idea right here, right, so we have uh, kings, priests, right, saints or prophets who were anointed. And the anointing, right, in the Hebrew, Right sense from the Old Testament from the from the groundation from the roots right in the Hebrew sense was an act of consecrating or officiating someone in their respective office. So we have mashach. Mashach is the root, and the root idea BDB says to smear, to anoint, to spread a liquid, to smear, to anoint as consecration, to anoint, to consecrate, right? To consecrate. It also means to paint and strong's definition check this out a primitive root to rub with oil that is to anoint by implication to consecrate like to officiate also it means to paint mm, the icons think about the iconography think about the icons and the paintings and also i want to heal up ross elijah tafari yes i you know one of the great iconographists you know of our present we say our present manifestation revelation rastafari of this time right here also there's a sister laura james also you know just to point out these um anointers according to the art and according to the iconography so we can see a link between the to rub with oil which is anointing right the idea of anointing the implication of that um rubbing with oil or pouring oil on right is to officiate Priests, the high priest, the other priests, right, like Aaron and his sons, also the kings, right, we get this anointing of the kings, right, we have what, we had um, um, Saul, Shaul, the first king, we had David, we had Solomon, right, we have the king of kings, and also it means to paint, so just take note of anoint and paint, think about it, when you put oil on one, my smear oil is almost likened, right, symbolically, right, to the act of painting, right, the act of painting. Now, why did we go here? We went here just to clarify, right, John 4 and 25 says the woman, the woman of Samaritan, the Samaritan woman, she saved to him. I know that Messiah, we know this in the Hebrews, Moshiach, cometh, who is called Christ. So the interpretation from the Hebrew, because the Yehudi or the Jews were living in a time somewhat similar to us, right, where we are that Hebrew, that Israelite people, right, but we have kind of fallen out of grace with our own knowledge of our own language and customs. Some of us know, but most of us don't know. So those who do know, they will have to translate or interpret for us so we can get an idea. So she's saying that she knows that the Moshiach, the Messiah, Hebraically, right, cometh, who is called, he is called Christos, right, because that's the popular vernacular. It's like if we're speaking English today, I should not use Moshiach or even Christos. I should just use the anointed. So it's like if we stop using for a moment in English, Moshiach, and, which is Hebrew, or Christos, which is Koine, Coptic Greek, and we just use the anointed. So that the one who's called the anointed, Moshiach, who is called the anointed. So back then they were speaking Greek. So Moshiach, who is called Christos. But it's still the root is Moshiach, right? When he is come, he will tell us all things. This is what the woman of Samaria, this was her, we say her belief. So it's important to just touch on that right there for a moment as we move forward right here. Second paragraph. Right, let's zoom in on the second paragraph. No doubt you all remember reading in the Acts of the Apostles of how Philip baptized the Ethiopian official. He is the first Ethiopian on record to have followed Christ or to have followed Moshiach, to have followed the anointed. 
And we speak about the anointed. Let's keep this in context with some of the anointed in the Judeo Coptic, the Judeo Christian sense. We're not speaking of other peoples have their anointed ones, they have their traditions, their ceremonies, so forth and so on. We're speaking from a Hebrew root. We're speaking according to the royal order of the Ethiopian Hebrews, speaking according to the Israelites of Ethiopia. So here, his imperial majesty, the king of kings upon the throne of great King David, is saying that the Ethiopian official known as Philip, I mean, known as, well, the, the question, what was the Ethiopian official's name? It's interesting. We'll get to that. But Philip, one of the apostles, my right, disciples of Yeshua HaMoshiach, of Jesus Christos, baptized the Ethiopian official who in the KJV version is called the Ethiopian eunuch. All right, now one say he was a eunuch, wasn't an official. You know the, th the tricky thing is? Your, your translation, KJV. Do you know that Potiphar? Potiphar was a eunuch too. The same word that's used for eunuch was used for Potiphar in Genesis. But what, what happens? Well, he is called the, like an official, an officer. Officer who is one who acts officially. But the term eunuch, right, has a couple of applications from the ancient world. Even Yeshua points out three. Some are born eunuchs. Some are made eunuchs by other men. And some make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom, right, of Elohim, for the kingdom of God. So he is the first Ethiopian on record. So we're looking at record, what's factual, the factum, as they say in the Latin, factum. We're looking for the facts on the record to have followed Moshiach or followed Christos in the sense of Jesus or Yeshua. And from that day onwards, the word of God, you see how the word links? You see how the concept of word from the very beginning up here? So we have from the very beginning up here, let's do this right here. We have from the very beginning up here, where he says, where he says, in whatever language it might be written, the word remains one and the same. And then in the second paragraph, he says, from and from that day on was the word of Exiavi of the sustainer, Lotusipat, and be the praise, the word of Elohim has continued. Did what? Continued. He didn't say that the word started to grow. Now, why would he say continue, right? Well, from the true, right, perspective, right, from the true perspective of his mass and the perspective of the truth, the idea of, of Messiah, Moshiach, the concept of Messiah or anointed was already there, right, in the place that is referred to as Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa region, was already there from 40 A.D., we're talking about 40 A.D., circa 40 A.D., 40 or so A.D., right? Give or take, right, a few years, right? 40 A.D., right? Now, Yeshua, Hamoshia, is said by different ones. Some say it was 30-something A.D. when he was crucified. So that's very interesting. Sometimes they go from 27 A.D., sometimes all the way to 30-something, 30 34, some say 35 A.D., you know, because of the what they then to change laws and times, you know, like for example, you know, um, December, December means 10, right? Deca, Deca means 10 in, in Latin, but it's the 12th month, right? We have October, October, which month is October? Is October the, the, the eighth month, <laughs> right? Is October, Right, the eighth month. No, October is the tenth month. September, right? September. September means sept means seven, right? But September is actually the ninth month. So they've sought to change laws and times. So that's one reason why people say, "Well, what? You don't even know the day." Well, you don't really know the day. If you follow the Western Gentile Gregorian calendar, you just a guess, assume you believe. It's a matter of belief. We accept it really it's kind of belief but it's kind of like what what can you do about it that's what a lot of people think so you go along with it so don't be asking us we're giving you the most accurate right to the available documentation if you have better documentation step up present it we have 40 a.d my right? 40 about 40 a.d so that's right that's right we can say on the heels of the crucifixion death burial resurrection according to the scripture and according to the ancient the first century history so it was in the first century so we're, getting, we're presenting evidence right here for the first century. Now, what happened in the fourth century? That might have to be another vlog, right? Because we're going to just zoom in on this subject matter right here when we ask the question, 
right? When did Christianity first come, right, to Ethiopia? When did Christianity first come to Ethiopia? When? When did Christianity first come to Ethiopia? Some say 4th century, right? Was it the 4th century? 300 something AD? Or was it the 1st century? And was it this belief in Yeshua? See, it's all about Yeshua as HaMoshiach, that he is this prophesied Messiah, right? And this is something that many Christians don't even properly understand. They understand what the disciples who were Yehudim, right, who were, who were Jews, even black Jews, right, of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, who were black, who were Yehudi, they were explained like Paul, right, and Peter, they were explaining it from a perspective of being Yehudim, right, of being Jews and of being Israelites, Yehudi according to faith, and moreover, being Israelites and from a Hebrew perspective. Right? But as we start to study the Brit HaYeshan on the Old Testament, the Tanakh, we can get a clearer idea, even the Ethiopic Book of Enoch and other documents bring us and give us a fuller idea. But that being said, from that day onwards, the word, right, the word of Elohim, right, didn't say the translations, the word of God, didn't say the translations of the Bible, which speak things concerning God in different versions. No, it's saying that the word Remember, we just showed you in John chapter 1, the word. So we're translating and interpreting these things, right, according to their revealed context. Now, we can believe, you know, we can believe whatever we want to believe about this. But if we're going to look at, well, the available evidence, it's like in school where we have reading comprehension. They give us a passage to read, then they ask us questions. Now, the story, you may feel whatever we feel about the story, right, or about the characters in the story. But to those questions... Right, you know, who did this, who did what, why did he do it? If the answers are there within the document, within the text, within the narrative, then that's the true answer, not how we feel. What we see, what happens is like with reading comprehension. Many ones I remember in school, did, you know, got that kind of bad. That was to me the easiest class, right? Because what I had to do was read the story, enjoy the story, or not enjoy the story, but just read it. Right? Sometimes I enjoyed the stories I read, like during the reading comprehension test, sometimes I didn't. But when it came down to the question, I had to shut off my feelings and emotions. You know what I mean? Because feeling and emotions make for good servants, but poor masters. Right? I had to, I had to shut off or, or shut down the feelings and emotions from the mastery and just look at what was, what's the question? And let me just remember the text or go over the text and find the answer. Like, I, maybe I thought this should have, you know, in the story, this should have been different. I really feel that if this was like this, it would have been a better story or whatever like, like that. But if it's a matter of question and answer is based on the answer that we can find in the text, right? According to the text. So from that day on with the word, the word of God has continued to grow in the hearts of Ethiopians, right? And I might say for myself that from early childhood I was taught to appreciate the Bible and my love for it increases with the passage of time. Now, let's say this right here. I said this on, I think, Priest Isaac uh, podcast, uh, what was it, the Tiger's Den, Tiger's Temple, yeah, that um, when we say Bible over here from our 400 year experience, Right? Over here in the Americas and Caribbean, understanding all our pre-existing trauma and conditions, right? uh, uh, the whitewash version of Christianity. We should not bemuse ourselves that every form of Christianity or every group of people from even past and ancient times was practicing the same sort of Christianity. We should have to stop looking at Christianity as a monolith. Let's put it like that. Christianity, as it is called, is not a monolith. It's not just one piece of stone. It's, it's almost even, in a sense, could be considered almost like a pyramid, in a sense, for lack of a better, uh, I guess that's the best expression right there. It's a lot of stones put together. You know what I mean? When we talk Christian, look at the history of Christianity. You know, this is why when you look on the back of the dollar, right, where it has that um, Nubian, according to its geometrical angles, that Nubian pyramid, right, on the back of the dollar, you'll notice it's incomplete, you ever wonder why their pyramid on the back of the dollar is incomplete, right? And why we can liken Christianity to like the pyramid in the sense of many different stones, 
right all put together 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 to form one right to form one structure I say that to say that Christianity, we have first century Christianity, we have Christianity when it went into different regions of the world, we had Christianity when it went north and west into Europe, and we have Christianity when it went south and west into Ethiopia and into parts of Africa. You know what I mean? Especially into Tobia and Ethiopia, right? And this is what His Imperial Majesty is speaking about. And here we have a tradition, right? And evidence and history, right? That goes back, right? To the approximate time of Moses, even before that, but for the biblical record, on the biblical scriptural record, right? That we can also find in the Hebrew scriptures and, and documentation. We can go all the way back to Moses and his Ethiopian wife. It's on the point that out right there. Moses and his Ethiopian wife becomes, um, the oldest, one of the oldest in the Bible, right, references, right, to these peoples, right, being um, one, right. I'm not so, when I say this, I'm not saying all Hebrews or all Israelites. I'm not saying all, I'm saying that there is a connection. Here's where we get the connection, right, the historical connection. If we say, well, why do Ethiopia do certain things that seem a little bit like they're Hebrew or Jewish or Hebraic, right, and sometimes even overtly so, historically speaking, it's because there must have been some correspondence with, the, with these people and those people. You know what I'm saying? Like if, I, if in my family we speak a little bit of Spanish as well as English, right, that means that somewhere in my background there must be some Spanish connection or we speak some French, that means in my background, right, or we do some things in a classically way that is different, right, than the overt culture you see, or the overt people. So we have the Ethiopian connection at at least three important points historically. We have Moshe, Moses, right, and his Ethiopian wife. We have also Solomon, right, King Solomon, and the queen of Sheba, of Saba, Makeda, right? We also have, right, the Ethiopian official, aka the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, there's other links, too, in the scripture, but these are the major. These are the three major links right here. So, when His Majesty says concerning the Ethiopian official, on record to being the first to follow the Messiah called Christ, the Messiah who is interpreted as Christ, that's what the Bible said, right? In, in John chapter 1, right? We have found the Messiah that's being interpreted as Christ. So he is the first Ethiopian on record to have followed the Messiah, Moshiach, right? And note this too, as well, that the Ethiopian official called the Ethiopian eunuch, he had went to Jerusalem. He had gone to Jerusalem according to the Bible, according to Acts of the Apostles. He had gone there to worship. And did you know that this is one of the areas in the new translation, these new world translation of the Bible, this is one of the areas of the scripture they are trying to erase. They're trying to erase the Ethiopian eunuch's testimony. They're trying to throw doubt and shade and dispersion on the Ethiopian eunuch's testimony. There's actually some of the new Bibles, the post KJV Bibles that actually either edit out that verse, right, um, in Acts of the Apostles chapter, Eight. We're going to touch on that in a whole other video, but just to point out this so ones and ones can, you know, if they're possible, go ahead and check it out for themselves and verify what we're saying here. All right? So as Matthew says, and I might say for myself that from early childhood, I was taught to appreciate, and say appreciate love, but appreciate the Bible and my love for it increases with the passage of time. Now we have to recognize that the version and the way that, say, His Imperial Majesty and others, even in Tobia and Ethiopia, viewed the Bible historically is much different. It's 180 degree opposite than the experience of us, right, as Beta Israel of the West, as Beta Israel in the captivity. Under the times of the Gentiles, under so-called, you know, white racism, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, isms and schism. And he goes on to say, all through my troubles, I found it a cause of infinite comfort. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He asked, who can resist an invitation so full of compassion? 
right just a little bit more right here brothers and sisters right here just right here so what we're proving right here and we're going to give some background um point of reference including Roots of Rastafari by Virginia Lee Jacobs, we thought we would go through her document. In fact, her book, right, is a very good book. It's a small book. It's like the Rasta man says, Liko, but it's Talawa. It's Tinishkin Tilikno. Bamarinya, Bamarinya Lamalet, to say it in Amharic, it's Tinishkin Tilikno. It's Tinish, Tinish is small, but Gin, Tilik is very, very important, right? It's like small, but big, so to say right and there's a there's a section the third chapter it says the power of the trinity maybe we'll follow up with this uh, chapter power of the trinity right um just for ones and ones to see the document we're talking about let's see if we can um let's just show it right now since we, we're already doing this right here we'll come back to this we'll show it right now we're talking about this right here this book right here virginia lee jacobs roots of rastafari by, by Virginia Lee Jacobs. You should be able to find copies out. I'm not too sure if it's still in publication, but if there's a demand, you know, supply and demand, you know how it goes. Right? Roots of Rastafari here in chapter three. Chapter three called The Power of the Trinity. So we see a COINTELPRO has been going on because a lot of these books, when we came forward in Rastafari in the late 80s, early 90s, these were books that were in circulation, you know, and there was a lot of study. It was like education. We talk about New Jerusalem School of Hard Knocks. It was not just what we go through, you know, you know, as we tried, but it's also what we go through as we study, as we grow, right, and we ground. So we used to read and study these documents. Some men could read well, and some men maybe were not able to read, but they had good memories. But we all came together to gather, iron sharpened iron, each one teach one, right? Called Beta, called Baitis Raya La Revim, the Zeb Bazet. All of the house of Israel is responsible one for another. Right, so the roots, get a copy of this document, the roots of Rastafari, because in this small document, right, the small document, let's look at the pages right here just, just to give one example. It's about 130 pages, 130 pages, right, but it covers in, in, in brief relief, accurately, right, I would say... 90 something percent i mean it's a very very you know what i mean it's a very very good book because now when i hear ones and ones even rastafari even some elders speaking about things that are totally rastafari or ethiopia it's like it's like at best they're regurgitating a lot of stuff that the gentiles say that that is out there like the nowadays stuff it's like they just went and just googled anything out there you know but didn't really study don't really know how to kind of know have an understanding see understanding means why is this book better and more accurate than other books? We can articulate and show and prove. Therefore, we have a understanding. We can discriminate or discern why the difference, like in the Hebrew sense of understanding, is being able to discern the difference between two things that may be similar, but not the same, right? And to articulate, you know, to articulate the difference, right? Articulate the difference. So here, Here's what we're at right here. There's that other book also, Ethiopia and the Bible. That's another level of study, right, as we get more into the Bible. Because it seems as though some, a lot of Rastafari have a, have a, I think what it is is the COINTELPRO never stopped. Mm -hmm. See, and the COINTELPRO could be like, see, people think that the COINTELPRO is just like what happened in the, in the 50s and 60s, right, in the 70s. You know, like stopping black revolutionary, you know, self-sufficiency movements, stopping them, shutting them down, killing people and jailing people and, 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 and causing brother to fight brother on, on that level. By right? sowing seeds of dissent and discord and tail bear. No, no, no. It's not just that. Right. But it also has crept up into the intellectual zone because they said, what was it prompting these black folks back in the 60s and 70s? to talk about revolution and doing their own thing in black power it was the education as his majesty Kadamawi Halaslasi teach on that education is the key this is why I and I of the LOJ right society of his majesty says we need re-education we need an Ethiopian Hebrew re-education this is a necessity it's a must and necessity but let's go on his majesty says because of this personal experience 
This is what I said. Education, experience, and environment has ill-prepared a lot of us. Right? But because of his personal experience, which he says is this personal experience and the goodness of the Bible. Now, when I first read this, I said, wait, hold up for a moment. Because what I had got to know about the Bible and hear about the Bible and the studies back in the early 90s, that's when a lot of the, well, we say, when we say the real black power movement, right, and, and the real black consciousness movement, let me say the black consciousness, because we went from the black power of the 60s to even the resurrection, right, of the movement in the sense of the consciousness, which all automatically was pointing to that we needed education and give thanks to many of the ancestors and the elders, you know, the Dr. Benz, or Leonard Jeffries, hail up to Leonard Jeffries, he came to our school, Brooklyn College, back in the days, back in the 90s, also ones like John Henry Clark and so many other scholars out there will be here for a little moment and many some of them are still with us to this very day right so turn this to the black consciousness right we needed to raise our vibration we needed to know the truth for ourselves so there was a a um re um vitalize focus and emphasis on study reading lecture education expanding our our, our 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 mind our thoughts you know what i'm saying expanding our thoughts our, our reasoning right so to say all that right there when i read that his majesty said it's goodness of the bible i didn't have that that particular view because of things i heard from you know you know the different teachers and and scholars out there who are writing works a lot of the works that many ones and ones are still talking about to this day many of the babes because there's a whole new generation rising up in the consciousness so many of the books that they're speaking about it becomes interesting you know to have some of the younger brothers the brethren and sisters say oh i'm reading such and such a book and i'm like wow and he said have you read this before i said yeah 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 and so i like them just to finish get through it and then let's let's reason you know and to ground on it Right, so I automatically knew that the Bible and his experience, his Majesty's experience, and other faithful Ethiopian experience was different because they were not under this by a you know by white supremacy. It wasn't white supremacy. In fact, white supremacy or white racism is affecting Ethiopia more now after their pseudo revolution. The pseudo-revolution, Ethiopia's pseudo-revolution. Got to make that a video, a topic, a talking point right there. Ethiopia's pseudo-revolution, right, circa um, 1974, 75, right? And Ethiopia's pseudo-revolution, right? And the pseudo-revolution has done a lot of damage. But the pseudo-revolution, right, is more, right, under, you know, even though they talk one way, Look at the icons, look at the iconographies. Where are all the ancient, you know, we say black icons that many of our people going back over a hundred years, you know, becoming more acquainted with Ethiopia were pointing to. We used to point to the Ethiopian church as a, that's a black church. Look, they have black icons. Look, they have black Jesus, just like many of our brothers in South and Central America, the Negro Christos, the same sort of imagery they had. But where is it today? Uh, it's very rare today, and some people might think like there is none. There are, but it's been suppressed. Something has gone on, you know what I mean? Something has gone on, almost like while the, as the Messiah says, when the a husband men slept, right? Those who are supposed to be our leaders and teachers, you know, are supposed to guard against this. But as Matthew says, because of that personal experience and the goodness of the Bible, he says, I was resolved that all my countrymen should also share in this great blessing. And that by reading the Bible should find truth for themselves. Now one has to recognize this also, brothers and sisters. We're going to sum this up right here, not to be a long-winded on this right here. But when His Majesty says to find, read the Bible, what His Majesty was doing in Ethiopia was as groundbreaking as what Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., but what Martin Luther in the Protestant Reformation was doing. Right? Because up to this time it was the church and the clergy so in a sense his majesty like Yeshua HaMoshiach in the first advent was going up against you know the scribes and the Pharisees 
you know what I mean? And the Sadducees and the Herodians and all these different groups, right? And his own group, we can say, right? We could, is, is the Rastafari, <laughs> you know, that Nazarene, or even in another sense, the Bahitawi, so to speak. Therefore, I cause a new translation to be made from our ancient language into the language that the old and young understood and spoke. So that, that area right there, as we study and put it into context, is the fulfillment is, is one of the fulfillments of Revelation 5 and 5. Mystify by 5. Mystify. Mystify? Mystify by 5. Revelation 5 and 5. When it talks about in chapter 5 of Revelation, to seal, right? To loose the seals, right? Another way of looking at that from the language, seals, you know what? Seal, a seal is a stamp. And printing, the printing press is also stamps. You have to over the connection here. Weep not, behold, no man, right, in heaven or earth, under the earth was able to what? To open it, right? His mass, he opened and opened that understanding, right, by the King of Kings Bible, his Bible, which is the Revelation 5.5. 5. That's what it says, for then he would turn to the people, right, a pure language. Like pure means refined. Pure is not the original, the first, but when you refine something, like you puree, you ever puree something, right? It's a process, right? It's the best, from all that arrest that has proceeded, right? We're going to refine something for us now. That's what is purified, right? People get confused with that. You know, when we talk about the pure language, they think we're talking about, you know, the first, you know, the old, or what they spoke way back when. No, we're talking about from all the forms of the language, bringing forward a language now that as his majesty says here the language that the old and young understood and spoke so he's talking about the lasana and the goose and the guest here's what we speak about when we talk about royal amharic royal amharic should not be confused with regular amharic once again royal amharic hold on for a moment brothers and sisters sisters and brothers gotta write this down royal amharic because sometimes when we're on you know doing this it's the holy spirit you know, that is showing us even more than what we came to it with. Royal Amharic is different, right? Is different from regular, from regular, right, Amharic. When we say regular Amharic, we're talking about nowadays Amharic. And we can show, easily show and prove this, right? Even with some Ethiopians that we have met over the years, who's all into his Matthew's Bible, and we brought it to them and said, hey, can you read this? What's this about? And many of them told me that, that they can read it because it's in the letters and they understand the sounds of the letters and the words that they make but the understanding was what was lacking I said what I said what and I went into some parts and I explained and they would like cheer me on like wow you got this how you know this how you know this I don't know how many times I've heard that how you know this how you know this how you know this ah, go bez go bez go bez you know and it took me a little moment to really understand that I said but wait you was born seeing these letters and ciphers so that should be you should, but then I got it. It's like today, if I put Shakespeare, right? You know, Shakespeare's writing in the writing from back in those days, right? Not, not like kind of translated to the way people speak today, but the way they spoke then. A lot of people today would not understand like old Victorian, you know, Jamesian English or Shakespearean English. You know, they would not understand or Victorian English even might be difficult. And ones who know what I'm talking about understand. So therefore, even the English language is not a monolith. Though we can refer to it generally. But as we get into the details, right, we find that there's different layers. You know, there's different layers, even with Christianity. So here we're going back to the beginning. So we see Ethiopians, right, right following the Moshia, the Christ, Yeshua, as early as the first century. Right? So when we say that when did Christianity, we, more better, when did Christ, right? it says from that, well, it says from that what? Go back here, it says, it says from that day onward, which day? The day that we have testified in Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. So his majesty is going all the way back there. Now the question I have is this, why do people keep telling us about 4th century and ignore the Ethiopian official? Right? They ignore the Ethiopian eunuch. 
Now we know that there's other ideas about the eunuch and we're not going to address that here. But let me just say that most of those other latter day ideas right, concerning the eunuch so-called sexuality is, is false. Right? It's just false. You know, what they're trying to do is get a, a biblical justification for something they want to do now by something that they, they misinterpret then. I mean, this, this happened so forth and so on, but that's a whole other area. We're speaking about this right here. Last paragraph. Let's go to last paragraph right here. Right? And this last paragraph right here. What does it say? The last paragraph says, Today, man sees all his hopes, all his hope and aspirations crumbling before him. He is perplexed and knows not whither, where he is drifting. But he must realize that the Bible is his refuge and the rallying point for all humanity. Now that in itself right there just makes you say, wow. What I hear some Rasta saying, and, and it's interesting, the, the philosophies, a lot of people are trying to philosophize. There's some things that are not philosophical. Right, you know, what I mean, not so much philosophical, it's just logic, it's the logos, it's the word. Today, man sees all his hope and aspirations crumbling before him, he is perplexed and knows not whither he is drifting. But he must realize that the Bible is his refuge and the rallying point for all humanity. So, is his majesty right? Is the king of kings right? Is the conquering line of the tribe of Judah right, or is he wrong about this? That's a whole other reason, right. In it, in it, speaking of the Bible, man will find the solution of his present difficulties and guidance for his future action. Now, we can see why we as Rastafari Israelites, and from an Israelite, a Yehudi perspective, right, this is a definite application for I and I. Right? This was the real message of Rastafari. So even to the Israelite brothers out there that say, oh, Ethiopia is this and Hannah Selassie is that, so forth and so on. If you're checking out this part, just understand what his majesty is saying right here. Right? And let's apply this from a Hebrew, you know, from a Hebrew perspective. Right? Let's let's apply this from a Hebrew perspective. Isn't this what we're saying? Right? That's the Bible, the scriptures, the who we are as Hebrews and as Israelites and how we got in this situation, right? And how we also can come up and out of this. In it, man, humanity will find solution of his present difficulties and guidance for his future action. And unless he accepts with clear conscience the Bible. Now, that's the difficult thing. With clear conscience. The Bible and, not just the Bible, it's a book, but and its great message this great message, he cannot hope for salvation. He cannot hope for salvation or for victory or preservation. For my part, I glory in the Bible. I, actually, we probably should call this one right here because this is still to the question right here about when did, you know, because the fourth century is preceded by this. This is why we went here first, instead of even going into the Frumentus and, you know, the shipwreck, uh, Syro, um, Syrio Phoenician, you know, Syrio Tyrian, Syrio Phoenician boys, and so forth and so on in the fourth century. So even when the fourth century, you know, the Azana history comes along, there were already those in that territory that we can call Ethiopia that were following Moshiach. That basically, for lack of a better word, that were, as we would say today, Christians. So it can be terminology like Ethiopian Christians. So Ethiopian Christians existed before Christianity became the state religion. It became the so-called state religion. In other words, the rulers, the people accepted it, right? The people accepted it. And the Kentuke rulers somewhat may have accepted it as well, but the people accepted it all from the first century. But the rulers and nobilities and so forth and so on, th then it became a state religion. Right? From the first century they accepted it, but in, in, in the fourth century it became a state religion. Just showing this book right here, Ethiopia and the Bible. Right? This also shows and proves the Hebrew, we can say the Hebrew, the Beta Israel, and also the different versions Right, we had the Hebrew that came in with the time of the Israelites from the Menelik time. Right, the Hebrew that came in. Right, um, we, we could say the oldest of the writings. 
but no doubt there was probably some mosaic connection seeing that he had a what moses had a kushawit an ethiopian an ethiopian wife and it's interesting because the ethiopian eunuch right he is the treasurer for kendike the queen of Meroe. now the Meroe is an interesting people and interesting history because they're the only ones that had beat the romans a queen Right? We could say a, a, a Ethiopian black queen beat the Romans and there's actually even um, um, there was actual even monumental relief. There's pictures of this relief, but they say that these monuments seem to have gotten lost where you see blonde hair and blue eyed Roman soldiers in captivity. Right? Because they tried to go south. And then they bucked up against the Kentuke Candace queens. Now remember, the Bible tells us that the Ethiopian eunuch or official was the treasurer of Kentuke, queen of the Ethiopians. And remember that historically we know that the queen of the Ethiopians and the Ethiopians had beaten through the Meroe, the Meroe civilization of that region, Mero, right, had beat the Romans and prevented Roman incursion deeper into the highlands right into the holy lands into the holy highlands right yes so just to point that out there just these historical facts so the question is why this is also the word sound of his majesty right here outside the kingdom of the lord there is no nation which is greater than any other god in history will remember your judgment these are said to be the words said to the imperial ma said by his imperial majesty right to the league of nations regarding their judgment the league of gentiles now look at the prophecy in zephaniah chapter 3 yes chapter 2 verse 12 is right and accurate but just scroll forward to the next chapter chapter 3 chapter 3 all roughly around verse 9 in that chapter chapter 3 it says that the lord says jehovah says that his determination is to gather the nations and to pour out upon them his fierce indignation mm. Now notice what happened when his majesty appealed for the righteous cause right, of Ethiopia right, in the covenant of Yisrael. That's so we have to note that Ethiopia right, of his majesty and even before was in that covenant of Yisrael because of the, the Shlomo, Solomon and the Sheba connection. We have to recognize we have a kingdom. Right? That's why it says in the word that David would never lack a man to sit upon the throne, right? The throne of David, right? Which is the throne of the Lord, the throne of God, which, according to the prophecy, becomes the throne which the Messiah, in the fullness of time, will seat upon. That was one of the controversies, even among some of the early, we could say the Yehudi, the Jews, and even among some of the early Nazarenes that later on be called Christians, but especially from the Jewish, the Yehudi, is that, well, if Yeshua is the Messiah, what about the prophecy that the Messiah will sit on the throne of David, that Yeshua did not sit on the throne of David? And then this is where other Christians, the Europeans, start to spiritualize these matters or spook out the matter and say, well, it's a throne up in the sky. It's somewhere else, but then as we look at the prophecy, it says it's the throne of David, which is on earth. So some will point to the sky god. That's how the whole sky god thing comes in. You know, where it's like, you know, you can go to heaven in the sky. But what the Bible teaches is the kingdom is to be established on earth. We could go from Daniel's prophecy, even the earlier prophecies in the areas of scripture, even to the New Testament says the very same thing. So like the New Testament actually says one thing directly, but the preachers and the pastors have kind of make believe. It's almost like 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 you're reading what you're reading, but you're misunderstanding it to be something else. Because that's how you've been made to believe. It's a make believe in, in counterfeit Christianity. So we talk we talk against Christianity, we're talking against counterfeit Christianity or anti Christianity, which is counterfeit Christianity for that whitewash and all the rest. Right. Let's go over here, brothers and sisters, sisters and brothers. All right. So we can get into a little more of the history right here. Right. Right. Get into the a little bit more of the history right here. Okay. The Ethiopian eunuch. Right. Fill up an Ethiopian, and we really need to pick up on that because there's a few areas that we need to touch on this particular subject matter. There's a lot of misinformation, COINTELPRO, you know, disinformation that has been circulated out there concerning, you know. 
fill up in the Ethiopian and the Ethiopian eunuch. Mm -hmm. Even things that, well, we'll touch on that right there. We're touching on this part right here in connection with when, when the faith in Christ first came into Ethiopia. So how is it that they go to all this fourth century thing and what they never really specify, right? So this is like the the Izana, one of the art word arts for Izana, right? You know, Izana, right? Izana, one of the first Christian emperors in the world. This is that is true. He's one of the first Christian emperors in the world, right? But to say that Christ first came to Ethiopia or the belief, the faith in Christ or the following of Christ first came into Ethiopia, right, in 330 AD in the fourth century is absolutely wrong. You know, that's where the disinformation, that's where the COINTELPRO kind of comes in, right, the disinformation, right? So King Azana, the second of the Aksumite Ethiopian Empire became one of the first nations to become a Christian state in 330 AD, one of the oldest surviving Christian nations in the world. Several Christian monuments date back to King Azana's time, such as the Ta'aka Ta Mariam, the Cathedral of St. Mary of Zion, one of the oldest Christian cathedrals on earth, which existed nearly 300 years right before Islam and 700 years I want you to see what what this says right here zoom in on it and 700 years right before Christianity was brought to Europe by North African missionaries can we note that right there North African missionaries before Christianity was brought right now notice when we say Christianity we're talking about a system of following Christ right a particular system of following Christ right and we're talking about Christ, right? See, our faith in the Christ and Moshiach is absolute. But in Christianities, it's less so, right? But this is, this is um, what occurred, we'll say, some hundreds of years later, right? So there was, it was already right. But what it was here was that now you get the rulers, right? You know, there's a difference between people believe in something and their rulers might not. You know, the common faith of the people is the faith of the people. And sometimes the rulers might have a different belief. They might tolerate the belief of the people as long as the people do whatever they're supposed to do according to, you know, the rulership of the rulers, right? But there are other times too, right, when the ruler and the people both believe likewise. Those are the ideal times. So we're not saying that, we're not saying that all the people believed in Christ and just the Azana didn't, right? But what we're saying is that the belief in Christ and that faith in Christ, that technically those who can be called Christians already existed, right, in the Horn of Africa region prior to. Because when we talk about Axum, we could look at some maps and some maps point to a more limited region, right, in the Horn of Africa, right, in the north of what we call Ethiopia. But there were other areas. You have to recognize there was no, like, borders in the sense that we call borders today. You know, people move, migrated, move back and forth, right? So we look at, you know, from then to now, this is also another kind of icon here. And we thought the icon here of Azana was interesting as it... It, it resembles somewhat his imperial majesty, right? You know, of Azana. Of course, we can see these are later, later images. This is some from Tigra, right? King Azana. Just for once, overstand what's at stake. This is a hashtag no more, hashtag Tigray genocide, right? Because sometimes ones and ones are getting on certain sides, you know, like that's why I say to Lion Rastafari is that we should be um, neutral. We should be pro-Ethiopian, especially pro-Ethiopian Hebrew, but pro-Ethiopian, right? But neutral in a lot of this lot of day politics. A lot of their politics concern certain particular issues that had nothing to do with us, right? You know, us who were in exile, right, abroad, right? So by joining this side or that side ignorantly, not understanding what's going on, you know, will be and can be and also has already proven to be very problematic, if not just outright dangerous. So in speaking about Izana, right, when we're speaking about Izana, 
right? King of Xana. Yes, King of Xana, right? Adopted, right? Christianity. He became a Christian. He was not of that belief, right? He became a Christian and he made it the state religion, right? So we have to understand the difference between, you know, the belief of the people, right? And the belief of the rulers. Right, so this is on the subject matter of Ethiopian Christianity. I haven't read this book, so we're not necessarily recommending this book, but we're not not recommending it either. We just like the title and what it covers, right? And hopefully, we'll get a copy and we can give a review on it. But Ethiopian Christianity, right? So, Ethiopian Christianity has this grassroots Christianity existed from even pre um, 40 or so AD with the Ethiopian official. Right? We can even go back into Old Testament times because the idea of Messiah right, is a living idea among those people who have a Judeo-Coptic, a Judeo-Christian, right? a Judeo root, right? a Hebrew, a Israelite of Ethiopia root. Right? Okay, so this is a little more on Azana. We can get into some of the details on Azana. I'd like to touch on Azana from the book that we mentioned. Right? So just to go through this a little well let's 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 show one some of the slides right here this is the Mohammedan period right all right this is Ethiopia Empire of Aksum Wagshum some say the name was Wagshum you can see the territory that this empire covered right you can see where the capital was the star and it went on both sides of the Red Sea right on both sides of the Red Sea on the the so-called Arabian side that's the Sheba side Right, and also on the so-called African side, right, the Ethiopian side, right, right, and testified by, you know, monuments and coins and stellas. This is a little bit of a clearer view, right? So notice this territory also includes Meroe. That's where the shape the Kandake, the Candese queens rule. And the Candese queen, right, was you could say the the ruler during the time of the Ethiopian um, official. Now, I like to call the Ethiopian official, you know, the, the black Jew, the Ethiopian Jew, because when, when the Bible says he went to Jerusalem for to worship, he, his purpose in being in Jerusalem wasn't just sightseeing or stuff like that. His purpose in Jerusalem, right, according to the scripture, his purpose in Jerusalem was one of worship. Right? He went there as a worshiper. So if he went to Jerusalem as a worshiper, we can ask the next question, what does that make him? That would make him a, a, a Ethiopian Jew, a Yehudi. Right? So he went there for religious reasons. Therefore, we can ask another question. Do we think that the Ethiopian official, known as the Ethiopian eunuch in the King James Version, do we think that he was the only... Yehudi, he, it was just him and just maybe his, his, whoever, his family or whatever. Now people say he was a eunuch, he couldn't be married. Well, the same word that defines eunuch is the same word that defines Potiphar. And Potiphar had a wife. Remember Potiphar? Potiphar, the one whose wife, um, according to the scripture, had, had, had tempted, you know, had tempted Joseph to um, commit um, sexual infidelity with her. And he had resisted. So he was official. So the term eunuch can mean eunuch in the sense that one might think it is, like in the, the, the true sense, or it can be one who is a servant, right? One who is a servant. Can a eunuch have a wife? Well, Potiphar did, right? So maybe the Ethiopian official called the eunuch is just, as his Matthew says, an official. But do we think that he was the only Yehudi, the only Jew, right? He might have been the only Yehudi or the only Jew, right, black Jew or Ethiopian Jew who could afford it, right, in a sense to make such a long travel, a long trot. Because mm -hmm. we're looking, right, we're zooming in right here on this, on this direct area right here, right? As we look at this particular area, now here we say Arabian civilization and so, but you have to understand, look how close that is. Look how close that is, right? You know, let's stop thinking like Europeans. Europeans like to say, oh, well, even though this place is close and they have common history, that they are still distinct and there is no, there's no um, merging of the two. 
but we can see in the language itself, even from Haric and other languages, there is like a, a, creo, a creolization, a creolization, like where these two things kind of blend and become one, right? So he traveled from way down here, my, from that region, all the way up here. Well, that's a trot, right? That definitely is a trot, as you can see some of the, the trade routes. You see how these trade routes go right here? right you see how these trade routes go right here so how did he go about this right by sea by land right here did he go all the way down by land right and then eventually you know cross over right you know you see where Meroway is right did he go to a certain point and take a ship across we don't know we know that he's in a chariot from Jerusalem and Jerusalem is way up here right so the Ethiopian official Right, went from down here where we have Merway, right, the Merway, right, section, and he went way up here, right, and when he was returning, this is when he met up, you know, with uh, Philip met up with him, and he became baptized, you know, and he became the first Ethiopian on record, on which record, on the biblical record. Interesting, some of these, um, um, you could say art and facts they found in Ethiopia like you know like churches that were you know maybe buried over or you know like dug up and they see these paintings I, was, I want you to see just how they show us you know we had different complexions right but we still are black people so this is how we were seeing Ethiopian um, art of Christ and of the people in the Bible and so forth and so on this is how it was right we could say this is how it be Right, and this is how it was. But now, when we compare it with what's going on today, in fact, just outrightly, we see that there's a whole bunch of Roman um, Catholic icons. You know what I mean? There's a whole bunch of Roman Catholic icons that we see, you know, in the modern, you know, in the what do we call it again? Um, um, the the post uh, pseudo Ethiopian revolution. Right, so former kings right there. I want to show you this right here. This is some of the stellas, and we can get into some of the language, you know. We look at the linguistics right here, the language, you know. We can see the similarities of the language, get into more of the details right there, like some of the stellas, you know, and what the stellas actually say, the translation, some of the coinage from that time, just to show and prove from the 4th century, right? You know, to have art and facts, you know, to find art and facts is precious. But just because we may not find art and facts, it does not dismiss, you know, the absence of evidence argument. It does not dismiss that because we're finding other evidence that all points to other evidence that is written in scripts, right? I mean, without actually finding like a little plaque that says this person lived and they date the plaque or whatever to be that time. Right, so let's just recognize that ones are trying to dismiss right, the true story right, by a lot of times you know, putting forth you know, doubt, right, putting forth doubt. Right? Because if we were to accept the truth of the matter, it will put doubt on what we've been made to believe as the lie. You know, if we accept the truth of what's being said, you know, both in the Bible, both by His Majesty, you know, in the Bible and by His Majesty, right? and also Right? including the historical record right? because ones would have said that without finding these things it didn't exist either right? and the great thing about this is that these, many of these things have been found right? and still remain in Ethiopia and in other places in the world right? so that means that the, the descendants of the people or the peoples and peoples that descend from these people right? or who live in these regions still are guardians of this history right? imagine if Ethiopia was taken over you know, if, if, the, if, if the Vatican, if the dragon, imagine if the dragon was successful in taking over Ethiopia, if the man-child was not born, right? what we would have or what they would be able to say. While they're looking at all this evidence, they would be able to say that, yeah, you'll never existed, you'll never had nothing, you'll never was nothing. You know, you'll never be nothing, you never was nothing, right? And that is a trick. That's a trick right there. Um, Let's just fulfill this right here. Give me one moment, brothers and sisters. Just like to do this right here. Give me one moment. Just doing something in the background as we're getting ready for the podcast tonight. You know, multi, 
you know, multitasking right here, 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 right? Throne room right there, right? Mystic, right? Okay, so right here, yeah, 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 here we go. That's like looking directly into the tabernacle. This is a view directly into the tabernacle. Judah, the tribe of Judah, was before the only entrance into the tabernacle. Right? And there were those curtains, those gates, right? And then when you look all the way through, if all the curtains and openings, you're standing right in front of the opening, you'll see straight into where the Ark of the Covenant is, right? And the Ark with the two cherubims, right? This is a likeness of those two angels on both sides of the empty throne, right? So we have His Majesty Seal right here, that's upside down. All right, let's go over here and let's let's do this. We're gonna scroll ahead. Let's scroll ahead for a moment, brothers and sisters. You've seen that one before, right? Yes, you know, go figure. All right, let's go all the way over here and let's scroll down here. And we want to show just a couple of books that are necessary books. Okay, one book right here. Recommend this one, Jim Ranking book right here. Jesus Yeshua in Ethiopia. Get a copy of Yeshua in Ethiopia, right? Where there's testimony and there's witness, right? Historical witness that when, when Yeshua, when Jesus and his Mar Mary and, and Joseph went, fled into um, Egypt, that they also went to Tobia or Ethiopia and the meeting between the Father and the Son. Get a copy of this particular book right here as well, right? As well right here, here, here. Um... Yeah, we can get into some more of the details right here. You know, began for search for the Ark of the Covenant. And then when they found other facts, right, that really proved to them that, yes, Yeshua, right, this is an Ethiopia shows 1,100-year-old painting of Yeshua and disciples in their church. Right here, here, here. You see him with his fro right here. Yes, you know, so you can see this is, this is how we, you know, first became acquainted, right? Is Matthew speaking about the Bible, the role of the Bible, right? Read and get the truth for ourselves. Um, let's go over here. We'll go straight through here, right? Go straight through here. So the Ancient of Days, right? The Ancient of Days, right? The Ancient of Days, right? His Majesty, right? Christ and His kingly character, right? So we even see that before His Majesty was born, that many of the iconographists in their doing their icons was seeing in the vision, right, His Majesty in the Second Advent, seeing Christ in that Second Advent, as Christ even said Himself, you shall see me but not see me, right, and say, what is this, that we will see you but not see you, right, because the Father is in the Son and the Son is in the Father, and He being in we, we be one, to Wahido. So right here, this particular book, Roots of Rastafari, right? Very important book. It gives a good summary, and it, it, it gives due relevance to the Bible, to the church, to the Tawahido, the doctrine, the teaching, you know, even connecting certain elements and aspects of ancient Egypt as well, you know, that was known, you know? And this is what we grew up to know as the truth, and we don't see this today. Right, so it's partly because a lot of these books and a lot of these documents and a lot of these studies. I mean, who is talking about this today? You know, these sort of books. Brother, I was reading, I was reading Rude to Rastafari. This is what ones and ones need to be talking about instead of this other stuff. You know what I mean? It's almost like fast food. Instead of us learning how to cook our own food, even cooking from scratch, right? We're going, you know, because we're hungry, so we're just eating fast food. But eating a lot of this fast food, you know, is very problematic, right? It's very problematic for us, you know? It's very unhealthy and very problematic, as we know, fast food. So the same thing with getting some fast, fast information here or there, right? It's easy, right? But it's like, who made this? What do they put in this food, right? We look at this sort of food right here, and this food is more holistic, right? This food is holistic because it's pointing to the same points of reference that His Imperial Majesty, our namesake, right? The, the Rastafari, right? The Rastafari, the man, Rastafari, upon the throne of great King David, Kedamawi Halasalase. Yes? 
So here, 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 also this book, if you can get a copy. We've been putting this out before that we really need more copies of this. You know, and heal up to Brother Zachariah. I don't know if you're going to check this out, bro. You know, but heal up to you as well for maintaining that legacy, you know, of the Archbishop Yitzhak. But find some way. I need to reason with the eye. And who, we need to get more copies of this car. I found that over the years, this has been a good point of reference on all things, almost all things concerning the church, the Orthodox Church, from the right perspective. This is what I'm trying to emphasize here. From the right and the righteous perspective, the Ethiopian Tawahido Church and intricately African Church, Archbishop Yitzhak's book right here, here, here. This is who we're speaking of. This is the book. You know, may Xiavir, you know, rest and bless his soul in grace and may he rise in glory. Besima yes yes so very very important book right here right this is the name of the book if you can get a copy of it right and this is the this is the one his mass he sent right sent to us right even concerning even the Ethiopian World Federation concerning Rastafari and the church and 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 the the we say theology of Rastafari vis-a-vis -vis what the church teach this book is crucial we cannot say this enough, but there are many ones who are fighting against His Majesty and also fought against Archbishop Yitzhak. Right? They also fought against Archbishop Yitzhak and they suppressed this particular book. Right? They suppressed this particular book. This is why if you look up this book, you might find this book going for hundreds of dollars. You know, we saw one almost a thousand something dollars. You know, next to the one about seven hundred something dollars. They make this book very hard to get. Right, because they don't want us to get, you know, the truth. Right, they don't want us to get the truth. Here, here, here. This is a liturgy book that we reprint right here. This is the cover we use on the liturgy book. Right, also mine that was updated, you know, from the one published in Ethiopia in 1959 by Archbishop Yitzhak. It's very important that we start to study these things so we can know the truth about our faith and not be getting the fast foods. Right, you know, the fast food on social media. You know, the fast fast food, um, fast food consciousness. You gotta watch out for that fast food, right, consciousness. So right here, 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 I think we've shown and proved, right? You know, shown and proved right here. Um, there's of course a little bit more right to touch on. Also this book right here, this book is by Ephraim Isaacs. Right, for those who have a you could say a um a Judeo, like a Hebrew, Beta Israel, you know, um, um, Neshama, so to speak. You know what I mean? This book right here is also very vital, right? This is a very vital book because here we have Ephraim Yitzhak showing that when the Ethiopians make the claim that before their Christianity there was uh, of the Ethiopian form of, of, of the Hebrew, Hebraicism or Judaism. Right? That the Beta Israel, the Hebrew faith, existed. And they were under, you could say, the, the, the Torah and the Old Testament covenant. Right? This book right here, it goes into a lot of show and proof. Right? Because as the brother says, you know, why would, you know, you know, um, you know, as a black Jew, you know, he was studying this and he sees that the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahido Church, right, is the most Jewish right of the christian churches and then he goes into a lot of details explaining things both from the orthodox tradition but then also from the ancient understanding jewish judaic and biblical tradition hebrew old testament tradition so that right there goes deeper as well to prove you know the oneness of what we're seeking to establish and say and maintain and prove show and prove right here anyway brothers and sisters we we've been a little bit longer in this than we expected but i hope that you know at least help to answer you know some of the basics you know of when you know when did the faith on the messiah the faith in the messiah first came with the son of king solomon right and the queen of sheba makeda all right, so that's pointing to sometime roughly around like nine, you know, 900. That's pointing to a period of time somewhere in 900 BC. So we're talking about 900 BC. So when the faith in Messiah 
from the Old Testament, the Hebrew, we can say the Torah, the Orit, the Orit, the Orita Muse, the Torah of Moses perspective. Well, that that first came with the Solomon and Sheba and their son Minulik, Bina Lechem, Eben Hakim, um, Dawit the second, right? David the second, right? Well, who's called Minulik or Kadamawi Minulik, Minulik the first, right? When the faith in Moshea, right? On record, we have about 40 AD, right? On record, we have in the first century, right? When did Ethiopia, um, the, the official religion, when did Christianity become the state religion in Ethiopia? Well, that is roughly the fourth century, and that is said on the record to be around three, 330, 333. But a little bit more on that when we get more into this book right here, The Roots of Rastafari. So stay tuned, brothers and sisters. Shalom, Chabarim, yes I. Salam ta tenai estalin, barhana salam, light and peace, brothers and sisters. Check us out, lojs.org, also here, Rastafari Jews, and also the evening stream, the evening service on Rastafari Israelites as well. Shalom, Chabarim, shalom. She was shalom.